Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Nick Balachandran to the show. Nick's passion for hiking and open water swimming led him into the waste industry after he kept encountering trash in otherwise beautiful, natural areas. Driven to take on the growing problem of waste, Nick realized a crucial piece was missing from zero waste initiatives, data. Specifically, data on the quantity, quality, and type of waste being disposed of. In 2016, he founded Zabble Inc. to create a SaaS platform with mobile and cloud technology to help large educational institutions and corporate organizations track their zero waste programs and gain real-time insights into their waste stream. Nick, how are you doing today? Hi, Raj. Um, I am doing great. Thanks for having us, uh, having me on the show. No, I'm super excited, especially in this time and, you know, during the COVID right now, I know a lot of things are changing, so I appreciate you taking the time out. So where are you, Nick? I'm in um, confined to my home in Walnut Creek, California right now. And how's the weather in Walnut Creek, California? It is hot. It's uh, about to go over 100 degrees today. Oh, my word. Now, is that north or south? Yeah, northern California. We're 20 miles east of San Francisco. Is it usually that warm up there? Um, not this time of the year. It is unusual for this time of the year. Uh, definitely, we've had a huge um, heat streak in the last um, couple of days. Well, I'm in Dallas and I'm feeling lucky. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So, Nick, I'd like to open my show by asking my guests the following question. If you could share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Um, I like making things really hard for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're the first. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I like pushing boundaries. Um, I, I've, I, I always had this conversation with friends, um, you know, in my teens. And I, I always told them that um, if things started going really easy for me, something's not right. I got to shake it up. Um and, and, and that kind of is what drives me to do things, um, th- you know, that I do. The hard things about hard things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so speaking of doing hard things, can you share something about your current organization? Um, yeah. Um, so I, I founded Zabble in uh, 2016. Uh, we are a B2B SaaS company, software as a service. Uh, we work with large institutions and corporate organizations to track, uh, to help them track success of their zero waste programs. So, how does the software work? Um, we essentially connect the entire workforce in the organization that has anything to do with waste. So, this could be uh, looking at trash cans inside the buildings to identify contamination or things that shouldn't be in, you know, in the streams like food waste in the recycling stream, um, food waste in the landfill streams or styrofoam, which is banned in by local jurisdictions. Um, it could be data that they, that they want to gather at the bins inside the buildings, at the various departments or different floors or in the cafeteria. Or it could be stuff that ultimately gets tossed out of the building at the loading dock that gets picked up by the hauler, um, which is ultimately what the buildings pay for. And everything in between related to the operations of managing their waste. Um, All that information is tracked on our software and it creates a workflow for the workforce to be connected and this information is aggregated in real time and shared with the stakeholders, whether it's the sustainability manager, the recycling manager, facilities manager, and so on. And we try to bring everyone on the same page when it comes to achieving their zero waste goals. So on a technical or tactical level, obviously, without giving away any trade secrets, do you use sensors in the trash cans? How does this work? 
So we are more of an aggregating platform. So we, we are agnostic to sensors. If the building does use sensors, we can easily uh, include them as data points. Um, what we are also, what we mainly track is the ability for the team to be, um, uh, to be on the same page with waste. Um, and so our platform sort of gathers all of the data. Um, as the staff is conducting their work, whether it's the custodial staff digging into trash or consolidating waste inside the buildings, or whether they notice uh, that a dumpster or a, or a container has broken wheels, or if there's items that are in there that shouldn't be in there, all of this information is sort of uh, tracked manually or automatically if there, if there are existing sensors or other companies that they work with. We uh, bring all of that data together and present it to them on one uh, platform. So, and I'm really curious, and that's why I'm asking. So, custodial staff, janitorial staff, how do they, mm-hmm. how do they input how much trash or waste is in a particular, you know, container bin into your platform? So we walk them through a workflow. Um, it's a series of of screens. Um, we have a mobile app um, that allows them to enter this information Mm -hmm. and the information that they enter it depends on their use case whether it's the data that they want to collect at the bin level inside the buildings and to sort of have uh, metadata associated with it whether it's a certain department or it's a certain type of trash can what the size of those trash cans are so we sort of let them inventorize all of the 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 bins um, and its uh, co-locations uh, within the building. And and then the data is sort of, of, of the contents inside the bins are entered as they go on. Um, and, and sort of that data is being aggregated in real time. And that data is coupled with other data, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, around um, maintenance or operational issues around waste um, in terms of whether the, the signage needs to be swapped on the bins because it's outdated, uh, there's some so, sort of signage that's incorrect, or whether the bins themselves need to be replaced and the organization is moving towards going to a new system of collecting garbage. Um, so all of the, the it's not just the trash itself, but it also, it, it also involves the amount of time it takes to service these bins for the collection. Um, and it sort of gives this holistic view of everything that's going on related to waste. Do you offer any kind of image recognition or photo opportunities in your app? Great question. Um, So we actually just concluded uh, a project with uh, San Francisco State University, and um, we are now currently incorporating um, the ability to recognize certain types of contents in the bins or even how full the bins are uh, by just taking a picture of the bins. I think it's really interesting. a little bit of a side project. I was part of this IoT forum here in Dallas mm-hmm. about five years ago, and there was an idea floating around regarding the, um, I guess, garbage containers, the the ones outside the people, the one that the garbage people come by and pick up, regarding putting IoT sensors in there that measured the fullness of yeah. the bins, and so they can essentially route them to the ones that were full and not have to waste time going to the ones that were empty. Yeah. There was also recognition of also some of the conversation regarding what kind of garbage is in there too. So putting a camera and a sensor on there. So I think what you're doing is really, really interesting. Curious what you've seen from a perhaps behavior change perspective or a waste management perspective internally or from employees in buildings. Yeah, so great question, right? So I think um, measuring the garbage when it is being tossed out at the loading dock by placing sensors gives you a certain perspective of what's in the bins. Now that has to be translated into some sort of meaningful information to the occupants or the building managers who themselves now can create processes to make sure that that waste doesn't end up in the wrong place or in the wrong container. And I think that's the missing piece is what we are spending most of our time to, and which is why I said we are agnostic to how the data comes in as long as that data comes in and provides a workflow for the managers to establish processes. In other words, uh, when the data comes in, 
in, through sensors or through our mobile platform, it sets up uh, an alerting system and it sort of, you know, triages uh, the different tasks that the departments have to sort of now go ahead and complete in order to make sure that that waste or, or, the, or the problem is curtailed at the source. And that sort of creates this uh, closed loop feedback system, which prevents certain type of repetitive issues from occurring and hence puts the organization on the path to increasing diversion from landfills or reducing waste from going into landfills, if that makes sense. It does, absolutely. Now, do you offer any kind of training to the staff? Uh, we The only training that we offer is as far as the usage of our platform goes. Um, but the, a huge piece of what we're trying to do is build cumulative intelligence into our platform by working with you know, some of these large uh, educational institutions and corporate organizations. And sort of every step we take in, in expanding our product offerings involves this intelligence which is now being shared by the the community of our you know clients um, in using our, our new sort of features and developments in our products. You know, as you were speaking, I'm imagining a scenario, and it's happened to me where I walk up to you know throw something away, and there's, there's three trash cans, and I'm not sure which trash can to throw the product in. It's mm-hmm. recyclable, non recyclable. Are you doing anything to address some of those issues too? So we are. We don't have a way right now to preemptively stop people from throwing things into the bins what we are working with is with the facility staff who are now having to deal with the repercussions of that and so what we do is identify the problem at the source as in which of these bins on an aggregate sense um, is seeing high amounts of contamination And then create that workflow for the staff to be able to now go ahead and investigate whether there's signage that needs to be changed or whether there's any particular sort of events happening in that area. And all of this data is digitally captured using our platform so they can actually see um, a digital trail of all the different events and sort of markers that uh, lead to certain causes from happening. You know, I think what you're doing is fascinating. Are you working with any of your clients right now to address waste along their supply chains? That is an excellent question. I think that is the direction in which we are moving is upwards towards the um, the towards source reduction and towards the supply chain and all the way at the top. And but we are starting from the trash cans and identifying what the contents are and the circumstances in which those contents or up here, and then we're working our way up uh, towards the supply chain. So that is our number one focus. So why the name Zabel? Uh, Zabel is, um, it's interesting. I was, when I started the company, I was trying to look, find, you know, cool names for the organization. And I stumbled upon, uh, or we were actually going through all of the uh, the words for trash in uh, different languages. Um, and so uh, one of them was um, the Arabic word for trash, which was Zabel, and um, hence the name Zabel was born. And it also turns out that the, the uh, there's these kids in Egypt who are known as the Zabelin, who form the informal economy of trash pickers that just go out to the dump and pull out things and try to build this secondary economy where they're where they're you know um, selling off those items, um, and so uh, sort of playing on that, we came up with this word called Zabel. So that's a really interesting story regarding the name Zabel. Were you able to harness the .com for yourself? Um, not quite. Apparently, it turns out there is a um, a gym equipment manufacturer in Australia <laughs> who's taken that name. So we were stuck with zabelinc.com. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get any dot com nowadays is almost impossible isn't it yeah absolutely <laughs> wow so you know this zero waste movement it it's quite fascinating you know you've got this data scientist background mm-hmm. the crux of our conversation is this why behind what you do so with your skill set you can be attacking many different to your point difficult hard problems why this particular problem yeah that's um I think that's the the core of everything I do is why am I doing what I'm doing? 
And um, just to give you an idea of, of, of my background, um, I, I was a data scientist, like you rightly pointed out, at, um, and I worked at a bunch of different startups in the Bay Area over the last 15 years, building really cool products. And, and the last of which was at an environmental sensing company in San Francisco, um, where I was kind of coming up with algorithms and stuff like that to, to measure how clean the air was and to, and to help people from knowing when the level of um, uh, you know, carbon dioxide was increasing uh, to a certain point in the, in the, in the air. Um, and it was, it was then that I was working with a lot of uh, different buildings in the built environment. Um, and I noticed that you know, everything was being measured. Um, uh, electricity, water, gas, even air quality at that point, um, except for waste, um, in a way in which it can lend itself for proper communication to the occupants, right? There wasn't a clean way to represent that information. And that was, you know, one of my sort of like, you know, uh, aha moments uh, of, of like, okay, why is this happening this way? At the same time, coincidentally, um, you know, being a, uh, an outdoor person, I was swimming in, in San Francisco Bay. I was training for these Alcatraz swims uh, from Alcatraz to land. I've done a bunch of them. But on one of those swims, I literally swam into a pile of trash. Um, and, you know, there was candy wrappers, snack bags, white plastic mm. trash bag. I can never forget that. And this was sort of my perfect storm. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to use my skills to... To, to sort of, you know, build things, I think I have to put it to, uh, to use to, you know, for this specific problem and identifying why is waste ending up in landfills, incinerators, the environment, and how can we gather the right information, the right metrics and communicate it to the stakeholders, to the right people, and, uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, eliminate waste from being even uh, created. So was this your first idea out of the gate? Um, out of the gate, yeah. I've had several ideas in the past that I've never made it past. waste. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. And, and in terms of waste, it's been a journey, right? Uh, it, it wasn't the idea on a, on a really high level is still to quantify and categorize waste in order to help us create uh, the circular economy, in order to help us drive what the, the future of uh, what it should look like um, in, you know, when you don't create waste. Um, and, and so uh, sort of we're evolving as an organization because you start off with an idea and you know what you want to do, but you don't really know how it's going to be beneficial uh, to, to the world. How do you figure out how to build something and put it into the hands of the right people who can then, you know, ultimately uh, this whole process results in less waste being created. Um, so it's a long journey, and, and we're sort of evolving and building as we go along. So as a fellow software company builder, I have so many questions, but I don't want to bore the audience, but I do want to find out, like your first customer conversations or even before you started building the product, how did those uh, go? Um, you know, I was, in a certain sense, I was fortunate Um the um, and I should say this also has a has a, um, um, a reason why uh, the company's named Zabel because one of our first sort of customers were uh, Palestinian Americans who owned a bunch of restaurants in San Francisco, um, and they were some of you know my early champions, and they really wanted to help figure out how to get better with their. The, the waste that is being generated in their restaurants and how they could manage them, save money while doing that, and also, you know, be one of those stewards in terms of uh, in, in reaching San Francisco's zero waste goals. Um, and, and so they sort of, you know, really embodied the idea of zero waste, and they were on board from day one. And so we had a platform to implement many different ideas. And so originally... Our first product was an IoT sensor, was a scale connected to the internet that we had actually deployed in multiple restaurants in San Francisco, and we were measuring waste uh, in real time. Um, and it was sending the data to our cloud, and we were aggregating that data um, and giving them instant feedback and reports on how they were doing uh, when their you know um, bins or carts were being picked up by the hauler. 
um, and stuff like that. And then, so that product sort of evolved. So we evolved not just our product, but also the market. Uh, so we went from IoT skills and restaurants to software and uh, large organizations. And that's a part of the journey in is in was in identifying, okay, how can we make the most impact in reducing waste from going to the landfill? And, and, and on doing some research, we found that 50% of today's landfill waste in the United States comes from one single sector, commercial buildings. And so that was another huge aha moment for us. And, and we were like, okay, this is, this is how, you know, we work with one large organization that operates multiple buildings in a city or across uh, cities, and, and we can help streamline their operations to reduce contamination and send less waste to the landfills. That's really interesting. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you could be speaking to one organization that has buildings throughout the nation and has essentially helped deploy your platform throughout their entire real estate portfolio? Correct. And that is exactly what we're doing. Some of our clients, before we were hit by COVID, some of our clients and organizations that we were speaking to were one of the largest real estate uh, property management companies in the United States. That is really interesting. And you mentioned COVID. What are some of the changes you've seen in people's behavior? Obviously, people are working from home more often, but conversations around waste during this time. Yeah, I mean, ironically, we've reached zero waste when it comes to commercial buildings now, right? Because everyone's working from home. Uh, so uh, we we ought to have, you know, packed our bags and 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 and, and you know uh, and got that received uh, a championship award for it. But unfortunately, the 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 distribution of waste has changed. Um, there's, you know, residential volumes have gone up by 40%. Um, hospitals are seeing a huge uptick in waste volumes. And there's one study by the American Nurses Association that said that 43% of waste is now can now be attributed to PPE in hospitals uh, during, you know, infectious disease isolation procedures. Um, and, and not to mention that on an average in the United States, uh, a typical person generates four and a half pounds of uh, waste per day. Um, but when it comes to a hospital, that number goes up to 25 pounds per person per day. And so, so again, going back just to data is this is how we can make an impact. And so we quickly pivoted from you know, commercial buildings to creating a, or retooling our platform to help hospitals. And now we're working with some of the largest hospitals in the Bay Area to help them get more streamlined towards, you know, in, in reducing PPE from ending up in the wrong bins and creating a bigger problem in terms of worker safety with contaminated uh, PPE. Yeah, as you were speaking, I was thinking about biohazard and, you know, potentially people not disposing of that correctly and how your platform could help with that too, especially once you incorporate some of this machine learning and identification of products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, we're just scratching the surface in terms of how the data that we're collecting can potentially help the organizations we're working with. Uh, but, but ideally, what we're trying to do is create a blueprint and different types of industries have a profile uh, just like people, you know, commercial buildings have a certain makeup or a distribution of waste. Uh, you know, for example, more office paper, you know, certain types of um, uh, containers for food, food waste, as opposed to hospitals that might have, you know, increased amounts of PPE, gowns, um, you know, sheets and other types of things. So what would be the ideal blueprint to create this ecosystem um, for, you know, organizations, right? And that's, and it needs a lot of data to, to figure what that is. And that's exactly where we are right now. So I see you also sit on the board of the Northern California Recycling Association in CRA. Um, right. What are some of the biggest challenges you see around these, you know, commercial buildings and recycling? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a really complicated world, um, of waste because you have, you know, just looking at the, the, the linear economy that we are, we are currently in, um, you know, we, we mine materials from the ground, 
we transport it to uh, you know manufacturing plants, create products, which again gets distributed to warehouses and then into the hands of people, and we use them for a couple seconds and then just toss them out, and it ends up in a landfill or the environment or an incinerator. And and so I think there's mul- multiple stakeholders in this ecosystem, um, from you know municipalities to manufacturers to distributors to ultimately consumers. Um, and I think we all need to work together in figuring out the how we can eliminate waste from being generated in the first place. Um, and there's numerous examples, there's numerous ways around the world where uh, institutions or organizations and municipalities have come together and, and created this uh, uh, blueprint. But I think, you know, everyone needs to work together and it is not an easy process and uh, to, to, to sort of completely eliminate waste. You know, I, I so agree. You said something right at the beginning there about it's complicated. I think it's really, really complicated. And I think it's going to be a long time before we can actually get to where we want to get from a zero waste perspective. But I really appreciate the fact that, you know, you decided to take on this hard challenge and create an application like this that's helping, at least from the commercial end. Is there anything like this that exists in the consumer world? I, I'm not aware of uh, anything um, it, that exists in the consumer world, especially because if you think about the time that a person spends throughout the day, I mean, there, there's numbers on, you know, uh, people spending 90% of their time in, in, in the built environment, right? So I think when you, when you speak of consumers, our approach was to identify the sort of umbrella uh, that a consumer can relate to. And when a consumer is an office goer go, who goes to an office and is now tied up with the organization that has its own goals, the organization is much larger in making these decisions that can actually make a huge impact. And so if we remove the consumer out of the equation and then make it, that person be a part of a larger um, entity, um, I, that is sort of our approach in, in our hypothesis in thinking that we'll be able to make a bigger impact in reaching the organization as opposed to individual consumers. You know, you're right. And as you said that, I was thinking about my own life and I think that, you know, I've become more vigilant in my personal life because of some of the behaviors that we do at the office. And plus in my daily life, I get to interact with individuals like you who are doing this kind of work. And so I know when I come home and my kids are running around and they want to throw something away, I'm, I'm, I'm more careful about, you know, are we throwing it in the right bin? Is it going into the right place, et cetera, mm-hmm. just because of, you know, some of the behaviors that we do at the office regarding recycling too. So I think, I, I think, you know, I really like that approach of going after the organization too, and perhaps some of the behaviors that people participate at the organization level, they will take to their homes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Great point. So Nick, what are some of the big learnings you've had on your journey besides it being difficult? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's, um, it's just navigating different types of difficulties, I guess. Um, it, it, you know, in terms of learnings, it's been exponential. And, you know, we, we just, my wife and I had a kid um, a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, she's barely, she's just 20 months old right now. Um, and, and it's literally, that journey has some parallels with, uh, with the business too is is in is in is in figuring out how to keep learning exponentially while making a fool out of yourself but that but that actually gives you the ability to keep constantly sort of learning and and be a sponge and so I think you know dropping that sense of um oh I think I know what you're talking about or or preemptively sort of assuming that that you are aware of something when you are, you're actually not or you're trying to put on a, a, a you know a facade. I think you know dropping that sort of helped me um, literally turn into a sponge for for information, um, and that was something that I really had to learn. Um, you know, in, in not having a background in building a business, although my dad is a successful businessman in India, I you know wasn't heavily involved in 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 that business. But I have learned uh, now of how to build a business from scratch by sort of embodying some of his qualities 
of of not having this this egoistic personality right like so i am basically a facilitator of things right now or or processes or other ideas in the organization um, and I'm. I just want to be someone who can foster innovation and help people, you know, reach, you know, new heights in their careers, for example. And so, sort of stepping outside of who I was as an employee and thinking about, you know, everyone else in the organization, sort of helped me understand uh, what is it that my role was. And I think, and it didn't have anything to do with my academic background or my past. Uh, It did in a way, but it wasn't, I'm not an engineer anymore. I'm not tied to certain things that have been certified by, you know, from in school. Um, And and so just knowing that, oh, okay, I'm I'm just not an engineer. I could do anything I want to if I truly believe in it and if I work hard for it, right? So those are some realizations that I'm really grateful for, you know, having learned uh, in, in this journey. I think that segues really nicely to my last question, which is, if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? And you can't say always be learning. <laughs> um, yeah, I th- well, I, I, I would say, um, you know, I, let me talk about a little uh, an incident or a group of incidents that, that are, that's really close to me and what drives me is every time I've sort of embarked on a mission um, or a, a mission to, to do better in some sense, whether it's personal, whether it's a hike or a swim or in, in business, um, I was always sort of met with resistance from one sort of one end of the spectrum. There's always people that, that didn't believe in me. And on the other end of the spectrum, there were always people that believed in me. And I could clearly see these two sort of, uh, you know, two ends of the spectrum. Um, And I I think as long as I knew that I could keep going on this journey and I had my support from my wife, my parents, my brother, my cousins and friends who have been there for me and always are, even to this day, I know that I can turn my dream into a reality. Um, and so I, I, this is one thing I always tell people is to, all, is to never give up on your dreams. And, and if you don't, the world sort of mysteriously comes together, conspires against its own self to make it happen for you. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And I believe in you. And I'm so happy that we got to have this conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? Um, no, I think I'm good. Well, Nick. Thank you so much, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for listening. And if you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And if you want to show your support, please share our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media, where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.